Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. Now, there's not much the Home Office does that isn't controversial. Crime, policing, antisocial behaviour and, of course, immigration, especially with a Met in crisis and small boat crossings in the headlines daily. And you don't get a much more divisive figure than the current Home Secretary, loved by the right of the Conservative Party, despised by many on the left. Well, this morning, we're going to be talking to Suella Braverman. Parliament might be on a break for Easter, but there is definitely no shortage of politics for us to discuss this morning. So, our guests. We're in just a moment, we're going to bring you that interview with the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who should be magically on the screen, but she wasn't there. We'll see her very soon, don't worry. For Labour, we'll talk to the party shadow levelling up Secretary Lisa Nandy. And we're going to hear from one of the most recognised faces from the Downing Street Covid briefings a few years ago, the now Chief Executive of the UK Health Security Agency, Dr Jenny Harries. We'll also have a really personal interview with the Employment Minister, that's Guy Offerman. And he's talking about his family's experience of losing a child after birth. It was an incredibly moving uh, interview to do as well. Well, we can start this morning with my interview with the Home Secretary. Just a few moments ago, I spoke to Suella Braverman. I started by asking about those delays at Dover. What's the latest update you give us on the situation in Dover? Well, I know that many families will be very concerned about some of the delays that we've been seeing at Dover over the last 24, 48 hours, people trying to get away for their Easter holidays. I would urge them to check their travel plans if they're about to set off to Dover, but that the situation is improving. Uh, there's been a, an acute level of pressure put on the ferry companies and the coach companies, a 35% increase in bookings. It's obviously always a busy time of year, uh, but the government's in close contact with the uh, uh, port authorities and the local resilience forum to ensure that we start getting people crossing the channel quickly. You, you talk about the increase uh, in people trying to make the journey, but of course it's a busy time of year. Um, the CEO of Dover Port has said the difference of living in a post-Brexit environment means that every passport needs to be checked. Do we need to, after Brexit, just get used to this happening at busy periods? No, I don't think that's fair to say this has been, uh, you know, an adverse effect of Brexit. I think we've seen, we've had many years now uh, since leaving the European Union and there's been, on the whole, very good uh, operations and processes so he's at wrong, then, you think, the, the CEO border. Of but what I would say is at acute times when there's a lot of pressure uh, crossing the channel, whether that's uh, uh, on the, uh, the tunnel or on ferries, then I think that there's always going to be a backup. And I just urge everybody to be a bit patient while the ferry companies work their way through the backlog. Um, I, there's just one other story I want to ask you about before we get on to your announcement. Um, three <laughs> British men being held by the Taliban. Now, one of them is Miles Rutledge, a so-called danger tourist. He returned to Afghanistan after being previously evacuated by armed forces from the UK. Is it irresponsible? Well, anyone travelling to uh, dangerous parts of the world should take uh, the utmost caution if they are going to do that. They should always act on the advice of the Foreign Office travel advice that sets and this out guy's clear been guidance. And this before. And I think, you know, if there are risks to people's safety, if they're a British citizen abroad, then the UK government is going to do whatever it takes to ensure that they're safe. Um, and uh, the government is in negotiations um, and working hard to ensure people uh, people's safety is upheld. So you are in negotiations then? To... Well, we're always... We're, if, there, if there are problems and if there are safety concerns uh, to British individuals abroad, then the FCDO will be uh, uh, working actively to ensure people's are safe. I want to talk now about your policy. It's about child sexual exploitation. Just explain <coughs> what it is that you're announcing today. Well, there's been uh, there's been several reports over recent years about what I consider to be one of the biggest scandals, actually, in recent years in in our history, uh, and that is a, a, a systematic and institutional failure to safeguard the welfare of children when it comes to sexual abuse. And we saw recently Professor Jay's report be published, and that makes very harrowing reading. And what I'm announcing today, and the Prime Minister will be building on this tomorrow, is a series of measures to bring an end to this and properly safeguard children. It's a consultation. 
Why, why is it a consultation? People have been demanding action for years. What's important to remember is that what we're seeing in grooming gangs or gangs of rapists is in towns and uh, cities around the country, uh, we're seeing a practice evolve, uh, which has evolved, which is taking advantage of vulnerable children. So and let's be honest, that's happening. you say it's a great scandal. Why are you consulting? Why do you not just take action? Well, we need to get the legal duty right. Uh, we don't want unintended consequences. But what's clear is that what we've seen is a practice whereby uh, vulnerable white mm. English girls, um, sometimes in care, sometimes who are in uh, challenging circumstances, being uh, pursued and raped and drugged and harmed by gangs of uh, British Pakistani men who've worked in child abuse rings or networks. We've seen institutions and state agencies, whether it's social workers, teachers, the police, uh, turn a blind eye to these, uh, to these signs of abuse out of political correctness, out of fear of being called racist, out of fear of being called bigoted. And as a result, thousands, we're not talking small numbers, we're talking large numbers, thousands of children have had their childhoods robbed and devastated. And there are many of these perpetrators still running wild, behaving in this way. And it's now down to the authorities to track these perpetrators down without fear or favour, relentlessly, and bring them to justice. You say that the Prime Minister's going to build on this tomorrow. What else are we expecting then? Well, today I've announced that we are going to uh, introduce a consultation on mandatory reporting. What the reports show is, as I said, professionals who uh, had duties on safeguarding and looking after the welfare of children saw the signs. Things were reported to them. Uh, um, concerns about abuse or rape or exploitation were disclosed to these professionals and they didn't take any action. It's outrageous. What we're looking at is imposing a duty on anybody or uh, p professionals who are in working in child safeguarding to actually report and take action when they come uh, into possession of information that may raise concerns. I think everyone is over the last few years has been horrified by some of the reports. And as you say, um, the fact that some of these girls were simply not believed, vulnerable young people not being believed, not being taken seriously. Um, do you also accept, though, that grooming gangs are not necessarily just Pakistani? So the Home Office report in 2020 found grooming gangs most commonly white. And despite some of the high profile uh, cases that we uh, described, uh, they said that the links between ethnicity and this form of offending could not be proven. Well, I refer you to the extensive report uh, about Rotherham. Uh, several years back, uh, followed by the report by Louise Casey. Um, those two reports were unflinching in their assessment of the problem. There have been several reports since about the predominance of certain ethnic groups, and I say British Pakistani males, who hold cultural values to totally at odds with British values, who see women in a demeaned and illegitimate way and pursue an outdated and, frankly, heinous approach uh, in terms of the way they behave. We've got to stamp that out with criminal law and proper safeguarding. And we're only going to do that if, as a society, we face up to the facts and the truth of what's actually going on. You talked there about Louise Casey, and a big part of this as well is trust in the Met, right? If you're talking about child sexual abuse and any sort of sexual abuse as well. <clears throat> now, the case review into the Met Police said it was institutionally racist and misogynistic. Is it fit for purpose? And you're Home Secretary, right? What are you going to do about it? Well, I've spoken at length about uh, the challenges with the Met and no one's shying away from the big challenges that the Met faces right now. No, we say no one's showing away from it. The Met Police Commissioner, Rob Rowley, has refused to use the word institutionally racist. Do you think he is actually not really getting to grips with the seriousness of what's happening? I disagree with that. Sir Mark Rowley and Dame Lynn Owens are the right people to lead the Met now, and Louise Casey accepts that as well in her report. Uh, also, Louise says that the vast majority of serving police officers in the Met are decent, law-abiding and uphold the highest I'm standards. Sure that's true, but at the same time, we've had serving Met police officers raping and murdering women, taking selfies with dead bodies, joking about domestic violence and race, making racist comments. I mean, it is actually incredible to see. Are you prepared to break up the Met if things don't improve? 
all of that is totally unacceptable. And the findings that Louise Casey makes um, of the instances of misogyny, racism, homophobia are all totally unacceptable. Would no you, one's denying that. Would you break up the Met if, if it doesn't improve? Well, even Louise Casey doesn't recommend breaking up the Met. So I'm personally not okay. uh, at that point. I think what we've got to do is raise standards of vetting and recruitment. I'm consulting on the dismissals power. What we found is chief constables lack sufficient powers to actually get rid of poor performance officers uh, absurdly and I'm if we need a change in the law I will do that but ultimately we've got to ensure that the Met Commissioner sticks to his turnaround plan and is held to account if by, does, by if the Mayor of London if that an happen, important an important element here is the governance now the PCC in this case the Labour Mayor of London has a lot okay. to answer for because okay. he's responsible ultimately for performance and outcomes by the Met um, now, I want to talk to you about uh, immigration as well, because in October, when you were talking about your policy to deport migrants to Rwanda, you said in a speech at the Tory party conference, I would love to have a front page of the Telegraph with a plane taking off to Rwanda. That's my dream. It's my obsession. Do you think that sounds a bit... A bit weird, I guess, is the phrase I'm looking at. It's your dream, it's your obsession to see a plane take you off to Rwanda. Listen, I make no apology. I care very passionately about uh, stopping the boats, just like the Prime Minister does, just like the vast majority of British people do. This is a problem of 45,000 people last year who arrived here illegally, uh, without a legal basis, without permission, abusing the generosity of the British people. We're spending over six million pounds a night on hotel so accommodation, we'll, we'll... three billion pounds last year. This cannot go on. So we can quibble about semantics, but the reality is, what action are we taking okay, to let's, stop let's the Let's talk about boats. action then. So will flights to Rwanda take off by the summer? Listen, I, uh, we are making very steady progress. Will they take off by the summer? I'm not going to give a deadline as to when flights will take off. Uh, we have to be okay. realistic. Okay. We've had a very strong victory in the High Court at okay. the end of last year on Rwanda. We've now introduced legislation. Okay. We want to move as quickly as possible to relocate people mm -hmm. from the UK to Rwanda. The Sun on Sunday is reporting you're set to announce a deal with a port authority at Portland in Dorset to dock a floating ship housing migrants. Is that true? Well, as, my, uh, as we announced earlier this week, we have, uh, we're going to be moving forward with I'm not asking about procuring... Moving forward. Is, that, is that true, that, about the, the deal in Portland? I'm not going to talk about private okay. commercial transactions okay. in and that negotiations. Case, in that case, right, you can't tell me when the flight's going to take off to Rwanda and we, we've got no information about, about um, sh whether or not these ships are going to be actually used or any information. So if you don't mind, I might not talk in depth about Rwanda or the ships because so far, since the policy was announced, we've had zero flights taking off to Rwanda, we've got zero announcements on the ships. Let's talk about things that are actually happening now, OK? And we can talk about these things when you've successfully sent a single person to Rwanda. Let's have a look. You mentioned the small boats gra graphics. This is the number of people arriving in the UK on small boats. You say there it's gone up and it has 45,755. This is under a Conservative government and it's also partly under you as Home Secretary. Do you accept that things are failing? I accept we've got an unsustainable problem. I've been very this, clear look, about look at that. The rise. It's under I'm aware of the numbers. Do you, do you admit the problem the is are failing? The, the context is important. We're in the middle of a global migration crisis. The UK is not alone with facing unprecedented numbers of illegal arrivals. You speak to the French, you speak to the US, you speak to other Western democracies. They are all grappling with unprecedented okay, so numbers no of illegal them. migrants. Let's what I'm saying, hotels, then. I mean, if I could talk, finish a sentence, then I might be able to set out what we're actually doing. Well, we we're, we're all de grappling with unprecedented numbers of people. We have to take action now. That's why we've introduced a bill with tough measures, which are both firm and humanitarian. They will introduce a okay. deterrent so that people stop taking the journey in the first place. And importantly, okay, and we'll talk the about evil people smuggling I'm happy, gangs I'm happy to talk are about stopped. When they actually happen, none of this stuff has actually happened yet, despite the policy being announced in April. Let's have a look at hotels. Asylum seekers in temporary accommodation, you can see it's spiking there. Do you take responsibility for this as Home Secretary? Well, you want to talk about things that have happened. I will show you some progress, actually. So since December, when the Prime Minister made his announcement uh, about our plan to stop the boats, we've struck a deal with Albania. We've now seen um, uh, uh, several hundred, about 500 people returned to Albania who came here. Um, unlawfully. Uh, we've also seen a record deal with the French.
French, which has enhanced our cooperation on the channel. That's a large part of the solution. Um, and we're now about to uh, procure and roll out bespoke accommodation for asylum seekers so we can start taking people out of hotels and moving in them into more affordable and appropriate accommodation. So you, you talk there about the successes. Um, and that, as you say, is partly because of the returns agreement you struck with Albania. So why aren't you talking about things like return agreements rather than talking about things like Rwanda, things like hotel barges, uh, barges for migrants that, frankly, you know, I just uh, forgive my scepticism, but they're not happening, are they? Well, I, I mean, I really disagree with your assumption. I mean, we're announcing these measures because we've been working intensively over the last few months to arrange. Um, agreements, provisions, these are large complex projects that we have to deliver. You can't just announce them and they happen overnight. Well, I mean, that's not the real world. Painful. The real world, in the real world, in working government, you have to take things step by step. Okay. You have to overcome legal, procedural planning challenges. We need to, we have made an announcement, a pretty pivotal and landmark announcement this week about several sites that we have identified around the country which okay. we believe are appropriate for a housing accommodate housing asylum seekers and we plan to start moving asylum seekers into those sites very soon if an asylum seeker enters the uk immediately uh, illegally sorry so if if an asylum seeker enters the uk illegally and then admits that they made a mistake <laughs> should they allow, be allowed to come back 6 days later i don't think um, that Get, paying a people smuggler thousands of pounds, risking your life in a flimsy dinghy with a thin piece of polystyrene as a life jacket, travelling at 2am at night in freezing cold conditions is a mistake. And I think anyone who takes the journey is um, breaking the law. The anyone reason... who procures that journey, offers it or facilitates it is breaking the law. Anyone who does that is making a deliberate decision to come to the UK illegally. You don't do that by mistake. And that's why we need a robust legal framework to ensure that anyone who does come from a safe country, remember, they're the coming from a safe country where they could claim asylum. There is no good reason as to why they should be taking that treacherous journey with the reason, people smuggling gangs to come to the UK on a flimsy dinghy. The reason I ask the question is that you resigned, of course, for committing a national security breach, for committing a security breach and for breaking ministerial rules. You then came back into the same job six days later. Do you just not think the rules apply to you? Uh, well, to correct you, I didn't commit a national security breach. Uh, I set out in full the circumstances of an email that I sent to a colleague about an issue which was uh, pretty much open government policy. There was no national security element, so please do correct your, your, your statement on that. Uh, what I'm saying is here, we need to ensure that there is a firm and robust legal framework by, if, whereby if you arrive in the UK illegally, you'll what be about detained. about firm and robust framework around the Minister You'll be detained. And, you did commit a security breach. You'll be detained and thereafter swiftly removed. That's what the British people want us to do. They want us to stop the boats. We need a deterrent. We need people to stop making that journey in the first place. We need to stop seeing 45,000 okay. people arriving here illegally. We need to stop housing 45,000 okay. people in hotels around towns and cities in the UK. That's when we'll be able to stop those. And that's why the Prime Minister's made it one of his five key pledges, because he knows the vast majority of British people care passionately okay. well, about we'll, this we'll challenge. At, we'll look at the figures uh, in, next time you're on the programme and see if there's been any improvement. I just want to talk a bit about you and what you stand for, because when you ran for the party leadership, <laughs> you wrote an article in the Express to launch your campaign and you said, we need to deliver rapid and large tax cuts. How do you feel being part of a government where taxes are due to you know, potentially reach their highest levels since the Second World War? I'm a low tax conservative and I know that uh, the Prime Minister is as well and everybody in the uh, cabinet is. And so why are taxes going up then? Well, we've had unprecedented shocks to our economy over recent years, whether that's the impacts of the pandemic, uh, uh, inflation caused by a global energy supply challenge because of the war in Ukraine. Those have required flexibility so on you're, the part you're, of our economic policy. You're I'm, comfortable with I the current tax levels? I am wholeheartedly then. supportive of the government's measured and balanced approach. We want to you're comfortable cut taxes, with the current tax but of course we need to get public spending under control. We need to uh, you need to get the debt down, we need to uh, grow the economy and we need to halve inflation. Those are parts of the okay. Prime Minister's plan. OK. Now, if I may, you're quite a divisive figure. I think that's probably, you know, no sort of secret. 
you become the face of a government's policy on migration that some people find you know, immeasurably cruel. You obviously <coughs> believe in it. Do you relish the fight or is it taking a bit of a personal toll on you? Well, I see my role as Home Secretary as um, getting results ultimately, taking action for the British people. I see myself as telling the truth for the British people to the British people. I see myself as being a voice for the law-abiding, patriotic, often silent majority. Uh, I see myself being heavily informed by the people in my constituency in Fareham who just want us to stop the boats. Although want, it is fair to say Labour want, are currently six points ahead on immigration. Who want us to see common sense policing, who want to keep the British people safe. That's my objective as Home Secretary. And, you know, if the... BBC or, you know, various celebrities are offended, then so be it. You talk about various celebrities. Uh, your husband did an interview recently where he spoke out about Gary Lineker's tweet where he compared the rhetoric around small boats uh, to that of 1930s Germany. Your husband said that legitimised some of the abuse that you faced. Do you think it's right that he's still presenting much of the day? Listen, it's not for me to decide uh, who the programming schedule for the BBC. Uh, you know, I, I've spoken about the issue uh, with Gary Lineker. What I think is important, what I think the majority of people really care about is the action we're taking. So the bill that we've introduced will make clear that if you arrive here illegally, you'll be detained and swiftly removed. I'm very optimistic about the passage of that bill. We've just had it go through several stages in the Commons recently. We're ongoing with our process. We've just announced new sites for accommodation of okay. asylum seekers. We're making progress on our, on our asylum backlog. We've seen several thousand of cases being made and increased productivity. Yeah. That's an in important element of our plan. We've reached a record deal with France, a returns agreement with Albania. I think we're making tangible process in a short period of time, but ultimately, Ultimately, yes, you'll judge us on our record. We're out of time. Thank you. Svela Braverman uh, right there, uh, saying that she will be judged on her record. And of course, we'll keep across uh, those numbers to see any movement on them. Uh, in the meantime, we can get the view from Labour now and speak to the party's shadow levelling up secretary, Lisa Nandy, who is in Salford for us. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, on the programme uh, today, Lisa. Um, just firstly, I started off with the situation in Dover when I spoke to the Home Secretary earlier. Uh, we've seen those cues, of course, the CEO of the port saying that one of the issues is that post-Brexit you have to check everyone's passport. Uh, Suella Braverman said that actually I don't think it's fair to say that this is an adverse effect of Brexit. Who's right? Well, actually, I think the problem is that we haven't had a government that has planned for what was going to happen post-Brexit. There are clearly a range of factors that have gone into the delays here, and we've seen them before. But um, the government has known for a very long time that they needed to make sure that there were um, resources in place to deal with additional paperwork checks. The point is not whether we left the European Union or not. The point was that we left with a government that made big promises and once again didn't deliver. And I really feel for the families that are trying to get away for a Easter break, people who've been caught up in this chaos, people whose livelihoods are threatened, it didn't need to be this way. And if the government got a grip, got down to brass tacks and started doing their actual job, all these things could be avoided. Uh, one of the other things uh, that we spoke about in the interview was the new policy to try and in consult on mandatory reporting uh, where people might have a fear that child sexual exploitation is taking place. Now, in the interview, the Home Secretary said that she felt it was one of the biggest scandals that we have seen, in her words, vulnerable white English girls being pursued and raped and drugged and harmed by gangs of British Pakistani men and that people have turned a blind eye due to political correctness. Do you think she's right? Look, I think we, the Home Secretary needs to get real. We're failing young people in this country online, in, on our streets and in their homes because the government is just simply not taking it seriously. 20 years ago, I was working with children who were being groomed by criminal gangs for the Children's Society, trying to help them escape that. There were huge problems with the courts at the time and them having to give evidence in person. There were, there were some delays in the court system that made it difficult for them to get access to justice. We'd called for mandatory reporting for 20 years so that professionals working with children and young people knew that they were under a duty to report on the behaviour of not just other people but of their own colleagues if they suspected that there was a problem. And here 
here we are after 13 years of Tory government and finally the Home Secretary has just woken up and said let's, let's do something about it and all we've got is a consultation. That is not the mark of a serious government. They must honestly think that we are fools if they think that we're going to fall for this as a sign that the government is taking seriously what is a huge scandal and an absolute disgrace for some of the most vulnerable young people in this country. I think everyone would agree um, about the scandal of these young girls not being listened to, um, appalling. But is she right to talk about the racial profile of some of these uh, gangs when, obviously, grooming gangs sadly happen across all cultures? It's true that they do happen across all cultures. There were, when I was working with children and young people, there were particular issues with... Um, Kurdish and Pakistani gangs in some parts of the country. There are also huge issues with white men grooming young girls online and there are also problems with boys as well. Let's not forget that boys uh, don't escape from these problems. It's just that often what happens is that they go even more unreported and unrecognised than girls. I think the problem with what the Home Secretary is trying to do is that she's trying to single out one particular profile and one particular group. And the risk is that if you do that, you miss the fact that there is child abuse going on in plain sight, in homes, on the streets and online. And we ought to surely be aiming to keep all young people safe from the harm that is created, not just singling out some young people and, and highlighting those forms of abuse and discrimination. This is a government that just hasn't taken that seriously for 13 years. So you'll excuse me if I'm sceptical about Home Secretary who suddenly pops up with a press release just a few months away potentially from a general election. A few months away from a general election? Do you know something that I don't? Well, I mean... When the, whenever the general election comes, we'll be ready for it. But okay. honestly, I mean, if you look at the failure of this government to preside over the huge backlogs in the courts at the moment, she's talking about young people being prevented from being harmed and getting access to justice. But the courts are, have come to a standstill because people can't get through them and they've presided over chaos. The online harms bill has been dragging on through the House of Commons with no sense of urgency. Okay. I would say to the Home Secretary, stop Start with the press releases, start rolling up your sleeves and doing your actual job. OK, now Labour is calling on the government to freeze council tax. Um, you are saying that you're going to pay for it through a windfall tax. It feels a little bit like as if the windfall tax is magically solving all of Labour's problems at the minute when we all know that, of course, the amount of money, the amount of revenue you get from a windfall tax fluctuates massively depending on the price of oil and gas, which is already uh, starting uh, to level out. You can't rely on it, can you, as a steady stream of income to fix every possible economic problem that's going to come your way? No, of course not. But we calculate that the windfall tax could raise around £10 billion. The cost that's of freezing council prices, tax right? this year would cost... The, but, but, but right now, if you were to do what we were asking the government to do, to cancel the investment allowances, to raise the level of the windfall tax and to backdate it to when we first called for it, you could raise about £10 billion. Now, if you raised about £10 billion, you could easily use about £2.92 billion of that to freeze council tax this year. I recognise that this is not a long-term solution to the problems that councils face. To do that, we need wholesale transformation of the way that councils and communities are funded in this country. But right now, people's food bills are going up, their housing bills are going up, their energy bills are going up, and their taxes are about to go up as well because the government is asking councils to put up council tax by 5%. We think that that is just wrong at a time when people are struggling and that we should use some of the money from the profits that big companies are making in order to ease the pain for people this April. I just feel like, I'm talking about the windfall tax because I feel like every interview we end up talking about the windfall tax and I accept it's a popular uh, policy, but it is just one policy that was announced over a year ago. What's the biggest policy that Labour has announced since the windfall tax? 
Well, I mean, we've announced, for example, that we want 70% of, um, of people to be able to realise their ambitions of home ownership. We announced that at a conference last year um, through a system of state-backed mortgage insurance. And Rachel Reeves and I have been working with the big lenders in order to make that a reality. I think... You know, policies like solving the housing crisis, introducing not breakfast clubs. Not policy to solve for, the housing crisis, um, though, is it? That's an yeah. ambition. Well, that's, not, that's not just policy, an ambition. It? It's an ambition that we intend to deliver. We'll set ourselves a target in government to do so, and we'll deliver on it. We've said um, just uh, earlier this month that we want to achieve the highest sustained growth in the G7, driven by people in all parts of Britain, and we're working across the board with businesses and council leaders and investors in order to make that a reality because we know in the end that windfall tax, a windfall tax will be a fairer way of funding things right now, but none of this can compensate for 13 years of low or no growth in this country if you want really good public services, if you want choices and chances for our kids in every part of the country, you've got to get the economy growing and I make no apology for saying that that's why Labour has made that absolutely central to our programme for government. OK, thank you very much uh, indeed, Lisa Nandy there for Labour. We well, are watching Sophie Ridge on uh, Sunday. Busy morning uh, so far, of course, dominated by uh, the interview with the Home Secretary. And now, as usual, the take is going to follow uh, this programme just after 9.30. Our chance to analyse today's interviews and talk through some news lines with our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, who I just want to talk to uh, now because we can get a quick take uh, from uh, Sam, uh, who is there for us. Um, with the Home Secretary, I was very keen not to get dragged into the Rwanda policy too much since that nothing has happened on it for over a year and it feels like it is you know, a bit of red meat, I guess, that they're keen to talk about. What did you make about of the interview? Look, I think that the government, the top of government, know that they have a problem. And what was fascinating uh, in your interview with Suella Braverman is that they cannot admit it in public. They've got a problem with small ba boats, and it's exactly the one that you honed in on when talking to the Home Secretary. Um, essentially, it's that they've made a lot of announcements, but they haven't actually changed very much. The legislation is still working its way through Parliament to change things. It's entirely unclear when we're going to actually get flight flights to Rwanda. The legal situation, if the Strasbourg court objects, well, it's not entirely clear what happens at that point and whether the government uh, would just ignore the court ruling uh, or press ahead. All of that means we are about, as the weather gets a little bit better, to have another season where people in government think there are going to be even more boats coming across the channel and people will see that footage all summer. So we're about to head into a period where, frankly, it's going to look like the government are failing because they haven't actually done anything yet. They've just made announcements. And I think that that discrepancy, they're not preparing the public for, and that's going to be an issue. Yeah, it certainly is. She said she'll be judged uh, on the record uh, and that, that well, we'll keep getting those graphs up. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, uh, indeed. We'll have more from Sam uh, later on, but still to come on the programme. In just a moment, we are going to be hearing from uh, this lady. You probably recognise her face from those COVID uh, briefings. She's the Chief Executive at the Health Security Agency, Jenny Harries. And a little later on, we're going to have a really personal interview with the Employment Minister and Conservative MP, Guy Opperman. Now, he's talking about his family's experience of baby loss, something I know affects so many families. Now, it's really hard to forget those Downing Street briefings during the COVID pandemic when the whole country seemed to stop and hang on to every word. You know, the tragedy of how many people had died, what new restrictions there could be on our lives. And they made a household name of many, including this woman. Over time, probably over the next six months, we will have a three-week review. We will see where we're going. We need to keep that lid on, and then gradually we will be able to hopefully adjust some of the social distancing measures and gradually get us all back to normal. I have to admit, I stood here, I think, about 10 days ago and said, uh, very uh, probably optimistically now in the past, we've, so we've solved the PPE position. So my apologies, because 48 hours later, I think, our distribution issue had popped back in again. 
Well, back then, uh, Dr Jenny Harries was the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England as part of an extraordinary career in public health. She was also on the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation and played central roles in the UK's response to Ebola, Zika, monkeypox, MERS, Novichok attacks and, of course... COVID. Well, she's now Chief Executive of the UK Health Security Agency, and I spoke to her a little earlier this week. Thanks so much for being on the programme. Um, two years on from setting up the UK Health Security Agency, can I ask the obvious question first? What does it actually do? Uh, well, we're here to protect lives, to save livelihoods. We have a, a, a remit to um, protect the population against not just infectious disease, but other external health threats, so uh, chemical, radiation, environmental hazards. Um, it's a new organisation. Those things always happened in the UK, but there is a particular focus on it now, and we're able, I think, more obviously, to deploy our scientific skills particularly. I mean, you were set up in the middle of COVID. It's been a bit of a journey, I can imagine. <laughs> I think that's a fair description. Uh, when I'm talking to people and often they'll ask me that question, I say uh, it's been a very exciting time. It's a bit like um, uh, an exaggerated action learning set. Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, we were put up as a, as a new organisation in the middle of a pandemic to fight pandemics, and that's one of our uh, principal focuses. Uh, but nevertheless, sitting at the back of this is a, a considerable amount of work that goes on routinely that I think many of the public are not aware of. So routine surveillance of huge numbers of infectious diseases, as well as uh, operational capability to respond to health threats. For example, just recently you've seen the, the Dorset leakage, for example, that was our Southwest Health Protection Team uh, sorting, cooperating with uh, blue light services on oil leakage in a harbour. So a whole host of things ongoing all the time. If you're talking about kind of upcoming threats and challenges, is there anything that you've got your eye on that you're particularly worried about? We are reviewing this at the moment because I think it's important as a new agency that we have a very systematic approach, perhaps in a new way that the country hasn't had. There's always been a, a national risk uh, assessment ongoing continuously. Uh, but I think what we've seen with COVID is a new focus and understanding of how severe and how significant infectious disease particularly can be, uh, not just in the UK but globally as well, to our lives but also our livelihoods, so both the health and economic costs. Mm. If we look back a few months, uh, we knew about monkeypox, mpox, for example. It's not a new virus. But the way that it has spread recently in terms of much wider transmission remains an ongoing concern. Mm. Um, but then if we look forward, of course, we're now talking about avian influenza. Again, not a new risk we've known about, but one where we are starting to see some changes in potentially in mammalian transmission, uh, not yet in humans. So with avian flu, it's something you're specifically looking at just in case it does start to become a risk to humans? Absolutely. That... And, and if any of your viewers want to look, one of the key um, aims of the organisation is to be as transparent as we possibly can with data and with our knowledge. Uh, and so one of the things we've become quite famous for, uh, possibly internationally more than in the UK, is our technical briefings. How much of a risk is it to humans? So the risk to humans at the moment has not changed, and that's what you'll, you'll see there. Um, but what we are starting to look at is the change. We obviously have genomic sequencing now, which gives us much more insight into how viruses are changing. Um, and we're starting to uh, look at uh, changes a little, uh, small changes, in mammalian uh, transmission. So we've had, for example, uh, Spanish mink farms and, uh, and a few seals. But I think the general message to people is this, if for human risk, okay. uh, it hasn't changed at all, but it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Now, of course, you're not a spokesperson for the NHS, um, but health services always impact each other. It's, 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 it, they're not um, independent, if you like. And I know a lot of our viewers are worried about the state of the NHS. You know, we've had a difficult winter with strep A, with flu, with COVID, of course, and pressures on, on doctors. And... I just want to take the opportunity, as I've got someone who isn't a politician in the chair, and can give me a bit more of a neutral response. How worried should we be about the state of the National Health Service? So, you're right, I'm not a politician, I am a doctor, <laughs> and it gives me a great opportunity, actually, to give a, a call out and thank you to all my clinical colleagues working on the front line right through COVID, but, as you said, particularly through recent incidents. Um, I mean, obviously, the overall strategic approach to NHS management is very much for politicians. I think what we've seen over this winter, though, is something which we could partially predict but mm. was difficult to understand uh, the detail of ahead. So you've mentioned IGAS, so invasive mm. group A streptococcal mm. disease. 
what we've seen with that is a different seasonality for it. And do you think that's because of COVID, because of the lockdown Al and Almost certainly. And... We've got high degrees of uncertainty where um, infectious diseases will overlap with each other. So what we've seen this year is, which we didn't want but had planned for, was flu interacting exactly at the same time as a COVID peak. So we had them together. Mm. Uh, we've had uh, Group A strep mm. uh, coming earlier, and we've had uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, which we'd normally see earlier coming a little bit later. And how is the health of the NHS itself? Because these kind of challenges are going to come up. Do you think it's in a good place? I'm not working directly on the front line mm. now, so I think those questions are much better asked of representatives directly. I, I do know that colleagues are working super hard, and I think the important thing for me is mm. getting shared understanding of what we're expecting, using our data, which we have done this winter, to help colleagues on the front line and in management predict what services might be impacted. Now, it's weird, because for me, it almost feels like COVID's a bit of a bad dream. Like, I can't really believe it actually happened. Um, is that a fair view or am I actually completely wrong and COVID is still actually a very real threat? Uh, it's very much here. Uh, it's going to be a threat in the same way that flu is a threat. Flu is still at the top of our uh, national risk assessment in case it changes and we have a flu pandemic. Uh, so I wouldn't like to think it had gone away, but what we have done and the living with COVID policy says is using vaccines particularly, but new treatments as well, we have largely got it under control at the moment. Um, I think your approach to it was a bad dream. Mm. Um, many people feel this. There's a natural psychology that says when some large event has happened and we've all worked our way through it, it's mm. nice to forget it. Mm. I think it's my responsibility leading the UK to say not to forget that mm. and make sure we learn uh, lessons from it, identify those and put them into action. You talk about those lessons. Uh, you mentioned the vaccines, which many would say that's the big success of our Absolutely. COVID response. What do you think was the biggest mistake? Um, so, there's a public inquiry ongoing and we're contributing to that along with everyone else. We want to learn from things that could have been done better, but I think there's a lot of retrospectoscoping mm. ongoing at the moment and that's quite dangerous. What we want is objective evidence of where we can do things better going forward. Mm. I think what we're trying to take forward is being more prepared about things that we can be, mm. but also using new science and new techniques. So, mm. you know, your, your three-year bad dream mm. has probably included you grabbing a, a test kit from the post mm -hmm. and putting it up your nose, sending it back, Many using times, a lateral yeah. flow test. <laughs> Those sorts of things were not available and not used by the public prior to COVID. So we're better prepared for future pandemics. And we can use those techniques for other infectious disease. And so I think there are opportunities there in what we can do going forward. I'm going to try and, and again, if I may, because, you know, you're being very good size stepping the question, saying we've got to wait for the public inquiry. Um, we don't want to be too retrospective, but you must have some views uh, on on the response. And, you know, we've got a lot of scrutiny on the, on the Prime Minister, on the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson as well. Is there, do you think that... What would you, is your main topic? So you would not expect me to comment on individuals or politicians. Mm. I, I don't think uh, that you'd expect that. I think there are lessons, and many of them actually, about some of the learning and guidance mm. for somebody like me mm. or a CMO, whether it's UK or abroad, have been published uh, in a, a document which I've contributed to on technical lessons, mm. which is probably our area. Mm. And I think there are things that we can do, firstly mm. about preparedness, mm. uh, getting testing set up. That's not as easy as it sounds, so developing things like pan assays, which is a, a, um, a sort of technical way of saying we can have a broad test and then we can hone it down, refine mm. it mm. when we have more detail. I think some of the areas where we've learnt is we've had very little knowledge about environmental transmission before mm. um, and we need to do that. We need to factor it into building designs, for example, mm. going forward as well. And one thing that worries me about the impact of COVID is public scepticism around vaccines and the anti-vax movement online, not just in relate to COVID vaccines, but also other really important vaccines like childhood vaccines, for example. Is that something that's concerned? So uh, there are a couple of things here. I think people have had a bad time for the last three years and actually we're almost seeing a little bit of vaccine fatigue. I mean, I would just like to highlight to people, particularly the most vulnerable, uh, the very elderly, that that is the life-saving intervention people should... For COVID. For that, COVID, yeah. absolutely. Uh, but we've also seen over recent years, not just recently, a drop-off in primary childhood vaccination. Mm -hmm. And of course, people have forgotten the importance of that. So we've seen recently 
uh, the emergence in so cases, for example, of polio, paralysis from polio uh, in Israel and the US. Um, and I think these are strong reminders that we need to boost our childhood vaccination, not remove mm. them. It, I mean, polio, it's, it's one of these things where you, you think it's almost been eradicated and then yes. you have that with other childhood yes. illnesses as well. Is there evidence that some of these things are starting to resurface here? So the particular case we've got now is because in some cases overseas, live uh, virus vaccines are used. That's not what we use routinely here, but then we can have odd cases being uh, coming into the country uh, and uh, if you don't have a properly vaccinated population, mm -hmm. uh, then they can change and, and actually cause polio themselves. So the real yes. trick here is just get your children vaccinated for polio and they are protected. Now, you're a scientist or you're a doctor, um, but you were suddenly thrust into the public eye in a very extreme way, um, I think, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You became one of the most recognisable people thanks to those daily press conferences. How was that? Slightly strange. Uh, not my natural place to go and immediately project myself forward on a number 10 podium, uh, but lots of learning and actually is a very privileged, mm. responsible position as well. What I hope I was able to do alongside uh, politicians was speak directly to members mm. of the public who perhaps were keen to hear from scientists mm. and from clinicians themselves. And I know from feedback I get that uh, I often meet people and they say, oh, I think it feels like we know you already. Mm. You've been in our sitting room. Um, there have been one or two strange moments as well. I've had a chicken named after me, for example. Chicken. A chicken. <laughs> um, and uh, just this week, we've had uh, a day with industry trying to work on those pathways to new vaccine development. And uh, somebody who attended our UKHSA Port and Down uh, offices said, oh, uh, my daughter has a teddy bear named after you. That's so quite sweet, actually. These are, these are not things I would have anticipated when I entered medical no. school. Were you a bit worried that, is that any WhatsApps from Matt Hancock might thrust you on the front pages again? Uh, well, I, I try and work exactly as I should as a civil servant and always keep unbiased in what I do. Very sensible uh, advice. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, my interview there with Dr Jenny Harries. Now, it's time for something a little bit different and uh, an interview that I found very difficult to do this week, but I think it's a subject that is really important and I know impacts so many people and so many families, often silently across the country. Now, back in the summer of 2020, the Conservative MP and Minister Guy Opperman and his wife, Laura, lost their newly born twin boys. Now, at the time, he said that they emerged from hospital shell-shocked and that coping with the grief was, of course, very hard. And there are more than half a million births in the UK each year, but there are still many unknowns around pregnancy, childbirth, and what can go wrong. Guy has been trying to look at how politicians and how Westminster can make the experiences, well, if not easier, because they'll never be easier, but he's looking at some of the legislation around that. And a little earlier, I spoke to Guy about his family's experience. So you have a little boy, Kitto. I do. How old is he? Eight months and two days. I've got to get this right. And the little darling woke me at 4.21 a.m. this morning uh, with a particularly troublesome snuffle and cough, but we are fine. What sort of personality do you think he's got? Uh, bubbly, bouncy, cheeky, uh, and always smiling, which is very sweet. He's just very optimistic. He has a positivity about life that is... Uh, he wakes up smiling and he basically lives his life smiling, which is wonderful to see. His glasses brimming over, let alone half full. Kito, though, will always be your third child. Yes. Um, the first child that you brought home from hospital. Yeah, first take home child. Um, what, what happened? To, what were the other so, two? Flora and I did IVF and struggled for very many uh, years to conceive and eventually had twins who we uh, managed to get just beyond 20 weeks. And then sadly in COVID, uh, they came too early basically. And uh, one came and went very quickly. And the second child uh, lived for a very long and difficult day, but we were able to share that day with them. And uh, we then uh, came to terms with the loss, but you, uh, you never regret the journey you've been on, if you know what I mean. And you never regret trying, albeit, like many parents, we weren't able to take our children home. How, what happened when you first found out that your wife was pregnant? Um, well, obviously, uh, most of all, if you've been on an IVF journey, it's relief, trust me. It, it's such a tough journey, 
particularly obviously for the woman, but as a couple, IVF is a miracle. You know, none of our, none of these people who have had IVF would have been able to conceive 30 years ago. As the pregnancy progressed and the babies got bigger. Well, first of all, you, you realize you're pregnant, then you realize you've got twins. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, obviously, you get to a, uh, a state of uh, fundamental happiness and excitement and all the usual things that parents get excited about, and mild terror as well. Yeah. And then, when did you find out that things were... So, we had a scan, and the scan was going fine. And then, a couple of days later, um, Flo didn't feel well and had some symptoms. So we went into hospital, uh, she went into hospital, of course, because I couldn't go. And uh, as a consequence, I was then rung and told, well, actually, um, things are not going at all well. And she'd begun giving birth way too early. And how old were they at that point? Uh, 21 going to 22 weeks. So it was early, it was early. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but this process then went on for a little while mm -hmm. and we lost one child and then we kind of, I mean, we spent nearly a week in hospital. Oh, that's so, yeah. Um, and you're trying to literally hang on to the second child and lots of mums lose one part of twins. And um, sadly, that wasn't to be. How was that day? You said it was a long day. Uh, okay. It was a very long day and you're so tired and you're so overwrought and run through and uh, and you are this also it's very tough even in modern maternity units so all around you mums and dads are giving birth yes and true. you're tucked away in a corner of a yeah. of a uh, hospital um, trying to save a child or in reality knowing because you've been given pretty good advice mm -hmm that it is very, very unlikely that your child will either survive or that will survive in a healthy form as well, and that if you're, you can take said child home, there is a high degree of risk of significant uh, deformity or disability by reason of coming so early. You know, they just don't develop in the right way. They need to be a mum's tongue, basically. So uh, that's a tough gig because all around you, you can hear women giving birth, uh, people being all excited, uh, and which makes it very difficult for the parents, and we've been through it, but as I say, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people have been through it as well. And you spent a lot of time talking to your child as well. Yes, we had a very special uh, couple of hours where we communicated our hopes and dreams and fears and aspirations and sadnesses, and also um, uh, and obviously held his hand and, and was with him and in circumstances where we probably understood this may yeah. not have a happy outcome. But um, the fair point to make is I've yet to meet a parent who didn't appreciate, even if it is a short period of time, in neonatal intensive care when the hospital tries to preserve the life, but also um, makes a delicate judgment call that um, some time for the parents, as this yeah. life takes what is inevitably, or in 99 times out of 100 is an inevitable course, is utterly priceless. Mm -hmm. And there's a very difficult conversation that the surgeon has to have, the consultant has to have with the parents about what do you want us to do? And do you want to try and resuscitate? Do you want to try and... And that's not an easy one, but I would... My lesson would be that day we spent, uh, albeit long and difficult, was priceless. Yeah. A day that you will always be with yeah, you. Yeah, of course. You, 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 um, you try your hardest to uh, encapsulate it, remember it and savour it because you realise it's probably not going to be um, uh, long-lasting. And the bit that really affects you is, um, you know, there are lots of mums and dads who don't get another chance. So you know in the back of your mind, this may be your only time ever in a maternity ward, and you may only have a day, and that if that's what life brings you, that's what life brings you. But 
That's a lot to take in. What did you call your, your babies? Uh, Teddy and Rafe. Obviously, this is such a, such a, the worst thing that any parent can go through, the absolute worst thing that any parent can go to through. But I guess having people like yourselves in Parliament who go through these things means that you can advocate on behalf of other people who have experienced it as well, which you have done. So I had a 49-day sabbatical courtesy of Liz Truss uh, where I was on the back benches, uh, which meant I could take part in uh, the back bench debate on uh, this particular issue and uh, was able to speak on this and make the case on this and have continued to advocate in a variety of forms with Department of Health, with uh, individual ministers. Maria Caulfield has been very helpful. And also to try and um, uh, advocate in, you know, the letters MP give you clout, there's no doubt whatsoever. And whether it's myself or my Labour colleague Toby Perkins or others who've been through this and there is an all-party group on baby loss of which cabinet members set it up and many people, one of the health ministers, Will Quince, is very active in that as well. There is a very strong voice, cross-party in Parliament, making the case for uh, better outcomes, better services, um, and uh, shouting the corner for those who feel uh, utterly devoid of a voice. The neonato care bill is currently going through Parliament, something that you have pushed for and supported. And that's about giving people proper time off to after something like this has happened. Yes, um, I, I think it's long overdue. It has got cross-party support. Um, it's in its last mm -hmm. stages in Parliament right now. And bluntly, it provides support to an individual who's been through this um, because uh, you, you can't go back to work straight away and you shouldn't be fundamentally penalised in your employee status by reason of a disastrous maternal event that has affected you. You um, are also pushing for less of a postcode lottery in terms of care. It is an honest fact to say that in this wonderful country it is not a universal nature of care mm. and you could be trying to give birth or having a difficult pregnancy in a particular part of the country and you will not get as good a service as you possibly will do in a specialist hospital in the centre of London where there are an awful lot of very impressive professors and experienced people. Mm. Do you um, think it's good enough for maternity care at the minute? I think, listen, I think it is very good. I know that there's things like the Ockerton Report and other reports. Bluntly, we, it, it is very good in this country, but it could be a lot better. You know, um, it's 2023, we could, A, we should have as close to universal approach. Secondly, there could be better guidance of how you deal with uh, births at 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 weeks, and a better understanding of how you handle that. Um, and every child is different, every mum is different, but we could be a lot better at that. And I think they are heading on that journey. I can imagine that the, you know, when you were pregnant with, um, when your wife was pregnant with Kitto, it must have been a stressful journey for the obvious reasons. Yes. But when he arrived healthy, that must have just been, I can't almost imagine. Well, um, relief, happiness, and, and, and the honest truth is um, uh, the degree of pain for those who sadly are not able to conceive and take home a child is, enormous and they will never get over that they just they you just don't get over that um your life goes on you get up you try to go to work you try to have a positive outlook on life but uh, you know there are too many people out there who really struggle with that so uh it's mostly relief and then obviously the underlying happiness of and the delight of 421 wake-ups and you were saying, obviously, about him being such a glass half full child as yes, well. Yes, he's a very, very lovable young man who seems uh, worryingly optimistic about everything in this rather tricky, complex world, which is delightful. And that's the most, the sweetest part of his character is that basically he seems just very chirpy about everything. Thank you so much for sharing the story. My pleasure. A oh, really powerful uh, interview. I'm sure lots of people would have been impacted by, you know, what Guy uh, Opperman 
has talked about so openly and so movingly and will definitely support some of the work that he's doing to try and change things and make it, I mean, I was going to say easier, but it's not easier, obviously. You can't make something like that easier, but to try and change some of the legislation and the law and the help available uh, to people and parents who find themselves in the worst possible uh, situation. Uh, we can take a look ahead now uh, in the world of politics because we're joined now by two women who really know their way around Westminster. Former political advisor to the Labour leader Ed Miliband, Sonia Soda, and Sawa Shah, who was a special advisor to the Conservative Home Secretary, Sajid Javid. Thanks both of you for being on the programme. We've just come off the back of a really moving interview. I know that you guys were both very moved by it as well. Um, and we were sort of talking about how it is important, isn't it, to sort of humanise politicians mm -hmm. as well. Um, Absolutely. And I think it's it's that thing. It's kind of understanding that our politicians are people who sometimes go through horrible forms of grief as well. I think it's sometimes a useful reminder, given all the abuse they get and, you know, the rightful sc scrutiny and accountability, which can be really robust. I think it's sometimes good to remember their people too. But also there is such a terrible stigma still around um, miscarriage. And it's a very kind of particular painful form of grief, I think, uh, that, that, that we we're starting to get better as a society at talking about, um, but I think there's probably still some way to go yet. Yeah. yeah, and I do think that it's wonderful that Guy's talking about it because it can't be easy at all, but, you know, that interview is going to prompt conversations. That interview might sort of help somebody going through a similar experience or help other people understand what those experiences are. So I think... Uh, a, a really great interview to do. Yeah, I was really happy that he was comfortable enough to share his story. And he did, like you say, you could tell, you know, you could tell by the way he was in the interview how impacted he clearly yeah. still felt by it. And also, I guess, you know, this is what Westminster at its best, isn't it? When you have people who've gone through something like that, life-changing, you'll never get over it. As he says, you know, you just learn to live with it rather than mm -hmm. moving on from it. Yeah. And you can use your experience to think, hang on, this, like, why don't we have better leave, for example, for people who've gone through mm. losing a child or a baby? You know, yeah. this should mm. happen, you know, mm. and then actually use their position to to make a change. No, absolutely. And, and quite often on these sorts of issues, it goes cross-party as well, yeah, which I think is a useful reminder that, you know, despite our politics, which can be very toxic mm. at times, there are some issues actually which politicians from different values and different political traditions can find common ground. Yeah, yeah. Really difficult subject to talk about. And I know, like, you know, we're all getting, you know, it's difficult yeah, watch and stuff, so, you know. <laughs> Um, we can talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, stories uh, that we covered on the programme uh, today. The big sort of announcement this morning was about child sexual exploitation mm. uh, and to try and get a, a basically a duty for people to report if they've got any concerns about particular children, because we've seen very vulnerable kids in particular being targeted, right? Absolutely, and it is really important. So we had the independent mm. inquiry on, to, on child sexual abuse, which reported last year after many, many years of work. I think it's important to say it looked at all forms of child mm. sexual abuse in society. So in institutions, grooming gangs, but mm. also in the home. Mm. And actually the sort of child sexual abuse that goes on in the home, it, it is more mm. common than we'd like to think. Mm. And it's really taboo, to, all forms of child sexual abuse are very taboo. And that gets in the way of it being being reported, dealt with. So much of it is preventable, um, but we sort of leave children to suffer. So I think it's really good to see that the Home Secretary is taking one of the recommendations of that independent inquiry last year. My concern about this announcement, which is basically putting a legal duty on professionals who work with children to report mm. suspicions of child sexual abuse, my concern about it is that it puts a lot of emphasis on the law as an mm. instrument of change and makes it sound like, you know, this stuff isn't getting reported because, you know, they're not legally obliged to mm. do it. Whereas actually, if you look at the research on this, we know that, um, you know, it's very, very taboo in society, which means that social workers, teachers, etc., they can be quite reluctant to identify it as a form mm. of suspected abuse because they know what it might mean mm. for a family in a school. And I guess if you get it wrong, then... Absolutely. You know, gonna have there's, not, there's not enough training around mm. it for, you know, even social workers get quite limited training on child sexual abuse, what the signs to watch for are. So the idea that you can just fix it with a change in the law is, I think, wrong. And I think we've got so much to do as a society to think about, well, how do we keep, you know, how do child well, professionals working with children really keep their eyes and ears peeled for some of the signs of child sexual abuse? Because it is preventable. Yeah. Um, you know, there are signs and children can be taken out of those situations and supported, but too many children are being left to kind of suffer this awful crime alone. I do think that the, the interesting thing here is 
that you can put something down as a statute and a duty, but ultimately, are you going to be able to pull the system together in mm -hmm. terms of resourcing and, you know, these cultural issues and training mm -hmm. that you've just mentioned, Sonia, about, you know, to get mm -hmm. the, what you want as the outcome. So, I mean, it's all, it's all that stuff that we're so used to in Westminster is that the announcement is there, you yeah. know that the press release has gone out, but actually the follow-through is going to require years of effort to make this actually work. Yeah, because it is so difficult, like you say. And actually, it's interesting because, you know, I'm always one of these people who I think if we're talking about crimes that are predominantly impacting women and girls, we should call that out and say it is. Mm. But I was quite pleased, actually, Lisa Nandy was like, actually, there's a lot of boys that yes. this impacts as well. Yes. And this can be even more taboo and more difficult. Not, yeah. I mean, maybe not, but, but, you know, it can be very difficult for those yeah, it's, boys. Yeah, it's so well. taboo. It's so different, difficult for yeah. children to talk about and raise their hands and say that yeah. something's happening to them, which is why it's so important that everyone who works with children is aware of some of the signs of it and feels comfortable reporting mm. it, investigating it. But we definitely have a child protection system at the moment where it is too mm. taboo, yeah. even amongst professionals working with children. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's why we're not able to do what we should be doing yeah. for these children. You spoke a bit about um, uh, in Westminster where you get the press release out, but it's the follow through that matters. And I just think this really applies to some of the policies around immigration as well. Because with the interview today, you know, I was, I was trying to, there's so much you can ask the Home Secretary about, right? So you're kind of like thinking, OK, you can do this, this, the police, the announcement today, you've got immigration, how do you whittle it all down? And I could have made the decision, I guess, not to focus too much mm. on Rwanda because it hasn't happened, right? Like, no mm. one's been mm. sent there. And I do still have a bit of scepticism about whether it is going to happen at all because Absolutely. of the delays. I, I don't know what you sort of, your sort of take us on it. Well, I think that there's so much that is going on behind the scenes. So as a former Home Office yeah. Special Advisor, <laughs> you know, yeah. my sympathy Come tends on, to happening? be with, <laughs> you know, the difficulty of, of what you need to do. And the Home Secretary's remit is so broad, you know, at any given moment, she's probably got sort of eight crises mm. going on that we're not even aware of. Um, so, you know, I have some sympathy for that. What I think is interesting is that you go big. So, you know, like the Prime Minister at the beginning of the year mm. has said, we're, we're going to deal with the small boat stuff. Um, but then actually following through with that then becomes difficult because there are challenges that will come your way that you probably didn't expect mm. or the ones that you did expect or, you know, whatever, mm. you know, tone that takes um, is challenging. Uh, so I do think that there is a limit to what you can actually say as kind of, mm. you know, a, a running narrative before you actually get to a point where either something is fixed or it's really obvious mm. that it's not going to be. I mean, she said be judged on the record and she will be, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, she's really holding herself hostage to fortune there because, I mean, I, I agree with you, Sophie. I think it's a completely unworkable plan. Experts have looked at it. There are so many holes in it, whether it's kind of international law, whether it's the practicalities of where do you detain people arriving um, in the UK? I mean, there's, detention is much, much more expensive than housing asylum seekers. We've got nowhere to do that. Um, you know, Rwanda, the agreement with Rwanda is to take, you know, what is effectively a small handful of, of you know, the people who are arriving on on small boats, um, where, are the, where are the vests going to go? I mean, it's just totally not worked out. And I can't help think that if you were a Home Secretary that was genuinely interested in addressing the issue around uh, an increasing volume of asylum claims, but it's not the highest it's ever been at the moment. It is mm. high, but it's not the highest it's ever been lots of countries are seeing an increase what you would do is focus on making the asylum system more humane but also more more, more robust so you would process lots of these people are genuine asylum seekers who are fleeing terrible conflict you know from regions like afghanistan where britain has been involved um you know you would pro you would look at their claims you would assess them fairly and quickly so people who've got a legitimate claim to be here can get a job can work for example can start a new life but people who don't have a leg legitimate claim you you deport and you deal with that. At the moment, people who are genuine asylum seekers, people who suffered the most awful kinds of torture and human rights abuses, are trapped in a system where it takes months, even years, to process our application. That's not humane, it's not fair to them, and it's not fair in terms of the system, in terms, you know, there are people here who, who could be deported. And I, the, the, I just think that's slightly in contention, though. I think if, you, if you're looking at it from, from her perspective, and I'm playing devil's advocate mm -hmm. here, I think the issue is how many of the people that are coming over via this route, small boats route, are genuine asylum seekers. Now, I don't, I'm not saying one way or another, but I think there has to be better numbers that are published because the contention from the Home Office is that actually you're getting a lot of people who are coming over that are, are economic migrants, and I think there should be much better Wait, numbers but if and you data look at, about Yeah, that. but if you look at the countries from which they're coming, um, you know, the, the, the top five countries in terms
terms of asylum claims are countries where we, you know, we know that there's a very high success rate. Although Albania um, is top, where that, in that's terms different. of small boat arrivals, not that in is, terms of the general. Well, yeah. in Albania, I think, is top of small boat yeah. arrivals. Yes, exactly, yeah. small boat. But in yeah. but oh, even yeah, yeah. It, in, if you look at the overall yeah. asylum system, the top five right, countries, yeah, yeah. which include small boats arrivals, but you're right, there's a different statistic. Um, but even with Albania, so so there's a lot of claims made that this is, you know, these are the only way you can figure this out is by like processing, processing yeah. and yeah. assessing and getting better data. There are mm. genuine because we have a massive human trafficking pro uh, uh, problem across Europe that actually affects mm. women okay. and girls, women being you know uh, trafficked for for sex work essentially, uh, prostitution. So um, you know it, it, it's it's I think it suits the Home Secretary to be able to make claims without evidence we about are, the invalidity of. Claims. We are out of time. It is such a hot issue. We could be talking about it uh, all morning. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the programme today. Great to talk to you uh, both on the show today. Thanks. Well, that's it for this week's uh, Sophie Ridge on Sunday. But don't go anywhere because after the break, we're going to be running through today's interviews and chatting to our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. Hello, you're watching Sophie Ridge on Sunday. The Take, a chance to look back at some of our interviews this morning on the programme, discuss some of the issues that we spoke about and what it means for the week ahead. It feels like we had a whole range of stuff on the programme. It feels like reeling after it, actually. Um, the big interview, of course, with the Home Secretary, Suella Bravo, and my first time for a long time having her in the studio to dissect some of those controversial policies, but also the chat with Guy Opperman, uh, the MP who spoke so movingly about losing uh, his twin boys, is still born, um, and it's such a touching interview, and I just think it's really powerful and something that will impact on lots of people. If you missed it, do get the chance to watch that one back. With Suella Braverman, it was quite interesting to try and work out the best way to approach the interview. There's so much that we could have spoken about, uh, whether it is crime, whether it is antisocial behaviour. I did focus on immigration, but I tried to do it in a slightly uh, different way because, of course, they want to talk about Rwanda, they want to talk about housing migrants on boats, neither of which have happened yet. Let's talk, shall we, to our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, to get his take on uh, the interview. Um, Sam, good to have you with us this morning. Uh, so the Home Secretary on the programme, it was one of those interviews where, to be honest, I wrote about three different versions and then kind of ripped them up and went with something completely different at the end. Um, what did you make of the, of the tone of the Home Secretary this morning? Well, I suspect one of the reasons that you did that, Sophie, is that it's not routine that the Home Secretary is put out on the kind of... Uh, to sit in the chair opposite you on a Sunday morning. We don't actually get very much of her doing uh, broadcast rounds like the one she's out and about doing this morning. And there's a very clear, it's a very obvious reason for that, which is... When it comes to government policy, her and Rishi Sunak are just a little bit further apart from one another uh, than perhaps number 10 is entirely comfortable with. So they look at these moments with nervousness. They know that it could be a moment where divisions uh, or certainly differences in emphasis between uh, the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister uh, can, can come through, which is why I think it's quite interesting uh, the way that essentially they have decided they decided to put quite a big and important announcement at the forefront of uh, the Home Secretary's uh, uh, media round this morning with this uh, announcement about the mandatory duty for people involved working with children uh, to report if there are any signs of child ex uh, sexual exploitation. It's a very, very big moment, and it's one that I think will be, broadly speaking, welcomed by uh, professionals. It is, Sophie, the culmination of seven years' work. It was 2018 when a Conservative government actually rejected the plan that now this government has decided to press ahead with, because if you do make it a criminal offence for people that work with children not to report uh, signs of sexual abuse. There were fears that that might overwhelm the system, that there simply wasn't the resource uh, to investigate every single claim made. Professionals nervous that there might be repercussions for them if they didn't point out absolutely everything. But the government have decided to uh, change the policy in favour uh, of this in uh, quite a big moment. But I thought it was fascinating to listen how Suella Braverman decided to sell this policy on your show this morning. Vulnerable white English girls, um, sometimes in care, sometimes who are in uh, challenging circumstances, being uh, pursued and raped and drugged and harmed 
by gangs of uh, British Pakistani men who've worked in child abuse rings or networks. We've seen institutions and state agencies, whether it's social workers, teachers, the police, uh, turn a blind eye to these, uh, to these signs of abuse out of political correctness, out of fear of being called racist, out of fear of being called bigoted. Yeah, you talked there about how she decided to sell the policy, and I think you're right that it's going to be something that will be welcomed, the actual ideas be behind the policy, uh, and that something is finally, hopefully, being done after a consultation, uh, even if that happens. Um, but she's leaning into the racial aspect of it, right? She's talking about British Pakistani men, and she's talking about people not reporting because of political correctness. That's right. And, and what Soila Braverman is doing there is referring to some of the appalling stories that we got um, in the last decade, often reported in The Times, actually, by Andrew Norfolk, about what happened in northern towns uh, with uh, Pakistani gangs. But that is only the tip of the iceberg. And, and, and it's worth reminding viewers that, you know, the inquiry that's led to this change is the inquiry into the Jimmy Savile affair. That's the uh, body of work after that scandal, the BBC presenter uh, who uh, later turned out to uh, have committed horrific uh, uh, acts of uh, abuse uh, and paedophilia. Uh, it is the inquiry into how that happened, I think, that's the main reason that has nudged the government into doing that. And that had nothing to do with northern gangs. Uh, so I think there are a variety of different... Uh, triggers for the change in the legislation, but the Home Secretary choosing uh, to pick one, as it were, type of case to publicise it. Uh, Lisa Nandy, the uh, Shadow Leveling Up Secretary, uh, actually pointing out that there are other groups that are vulnerable. In, indeed, it's not just young girls, it is uh, also some uh, boys as well. I mean, there was a major report about five years ago into the state of uh, sexual abuse of minors, and it is just incredible when you read through the sheer amount of depraved behaviour that is uh, that is going on below the surface in this country. It is a, a, a real scourge and a, a real problem affecting far more, uh, I think, than is uh, is, is often recognised and often talked about. And, and, and that's the thing, I think, that everybody wants to uh, tackle and sort out uh, yeah. as quickly as possible. That's absolutely right, absolutely right. Um, let's talk about immigration, shall we? Because, of course, that was also a big part of the interview uh, with Soella Braverman. There's been a lot of headlines about about Rwanda, an awful lot of headlines about a policy that hasn't actually borne any fruit yet. No one has actually been deported to Rwanda, no matter your feelings on whether it is the wrong or the right policy. So I was kind of keen to not just focus on that, which I think is territory perhaps the Home Secretary is comfortable talking about, uh, whether or not you agree with her or not, but also to look about the wider immigration picture. Let's have a little listen. Listen, I, uh, we are making very steady progress. Will they take off by the summer? I'm not going to give a deadline as to when flights will take off. Uh, we have to be okay. realistic. Okay. We've had a very strong victory in the High Court at okay. the end of last year on Rwanda. We've now introduced legislation. Okay. We want to move as quickly as possible to relocate people mm -hmm. from the UK to Rwanda. No deadline, Sam. No, and they can't do that because they don't know when the legislation that underpins a lot of this is going to get through the Houses of Parliament. So in the last month, uh, ministers, the Home Secretary introduced the immigration bill. That's winding its way through Parliament. But it's going to hit the House of Lords. And when it hits the House of Lords, it's going to have more amendments than the Christmas tree uh, strung up all over it, and that will slow down its passage. It is not clear that the legislation that makes their immigration policy possible will be on the statute books this year. And then separately, uh, you were referring to Rwanda. Now, the issue there is that although the government scored a victory in the High Court over uh, uh, the legality of the Rwanda policy last year, uh, the High Court also said that there needs to be a special care and attention uh, on every single individual case. So it's not clear uh, that domestically you're going to get uh, uh, cases, uh, individuals being waved through to be re returned. And there is another separate question about how the European Court of Human Rights, the Strasbourg uh, Court, uh, what 
what happens if that court decides uh, that, it, that once again, for a second time, that the flights can't take off? Last time, uh, this government, uh, the uh, the Tory government, decided that uh, it had to obey the ruling from Tra from Strasbourg. Uh, I'm getting mixed signals about whether or not they would just ignore uh, such a direction, or whether the Strasbourg court wouldn't dare uh, repeat that ruling a second time, or whether they would just uh, ignore it altogether. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. I, I, I think some in government think that. For instance, the sort of Gary Lineker row, the uh, attack by a, a well-known media personality of the government's uh, uh, immigration plan, uh, actually was a net win for Rishi Sunak in the sense that uh, he was quite proud of the way and quite firm in the way that he defended the policy uh, in quite neutral terms. I think some in government saw that actually as beneficial because it gave the Prime Minister uh, a big platform to set out their plans. But it has to be... Uh, uh, you just come back to two points, Sophie. First of all, none of this has actually happened. And secondly, actually, if you look at the polling, Labour are ahead of the Tories on immigration, I suspect because they're focused too on delivery, and, and that really hasn't begun yet. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I saw some of that polling. Six points ahead, I think it was, uh, on immigration and Labour, which it does feel quite unusual if you look at it, what's happened over uh, recent uh, years. Uh, Sam, thanks for the analysis. Uh, we're going to have more from Sam. Uh, but uh, before we do, I just want to play this quick clip uh, from the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, because people heading to France this weekend from Dover have really experienced those bad queues, lots having to wait overnight, some delays in more than 16 hours. And earlier I asked the Home Secretary whether, following Brexit, this could be a new normal. No, I don't think that's fair to say this has been, uh, you know, an adverse effect of Brexit. I think we've seen, we've had many years now uh, since leaving the European Union and there's been, on the whole, very good uh, operations and processes so he's wrong at and you think the, the CEO border. Calls. But what I would say is at acute times when there's a lot of pressure uh, crossing the channel, whether that's uh, uh, on the, uh, the tunnel or on ferries, then I think that there's always going to be a backup. And I just urge everybody to be a bit patient while the ferry companies work their way through the backlog. Uh, and on those severe delays in Dover, I also asked uh, Labour shadow levelling up Secretary Lisa Nandy uh, if it was Brexit that was effectively to blame. We haven't had a government that has planned for what was going to happen post-Brexit. There are clearly a range of factors that have gone into the delays here, and we've seen them before. But um, the government has known for a very long time that they needed to make sure that there were um, resources in place to deal with additional paperwork checks. The point is not whether we left the European Union or not. The point was that we left with a government that made big promises and once again didn't deliver. Well, let's talk to our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. Um, what do you make of the two... Now, we no-one really wanted to say it was because of Brexit directly, did they? No, I mean... You, you, I mean, you just sort of sigh at both of those answers. <laughs> Later on in the interview, the Home Secretary said that uh, she saw her job as essentially a truth-teller. Well, the reason, one of the big reasons that there are delays at the port of Dover is that there is additional paperwork uh, for people to get into the European Union. It, it, it is a factor. It just is, as the head of the port of Dover uh, has been saying. And it, it, and it feels odd to deny it point blank. You can do things about it as uh, the government. There must be uh, ways that uh, you can uh, put in more border posts, that you can try and ease uh, some of those delays. But you just, uh, just denying point blank, I don't think necessarily uh, that uh, Brexit has anything to do with it, necessarily will fill people with the confidence that this issue is going to be solved. And then you've got Labour that sort of wants to avoid having a row about the principles of Brexit. As ever, as with every single policy issue, uh, Labour frontbenchers decline to deal with the substance and instead, instead blame the government for incompetence, whether it's immigration, whether it's Brexit. There's the same pattern. I wonder how well it goes down with the public, never engaging on the big issue of the day, but just saying the government hasn't shown that it can't manage things properly. It's a playbook that I wonder uh, whether or not um, wears the public down in the weeks and months to come. Yeah, it's interesting. And you've definitely called it out uh, before uh, as well. Sam, I'm interested to get your overview because you spoke about it a little bit in the interview when, uh, when we were chatting earlier. And it does feel like Sir Braverman is leans in, doesn't she, to these culture war issues. You know, whether it is Rwanda, she leans into it. Whether it is the child sexual abuse, she's talking about political correctness there. She's saying that she's a truth teller, that she doesn't mind standing up to the BBC or Gary Lineker. Do you think that she's an asset to the Conservative Party when it comes to elections? Or do you think that actually she's putting off too many voters? 
Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that that really is a judgment for for voters. But I, I, I would just, as ever, urge in politics, you can never quite be cynical enough. Um, yes, she talks a good game. She talks a game that will appeal to a uh, selectra, a part of the Conservative Party and a part of the country, uh, no doubt. But I, I think the interesting question with Suella Braverman is whether the talk, whether the rhetoric lives up to the reality. So she is in a government that's done a compromise deal over Brexit of the sort that, frankly, I didn't think that uh, she would be particularly happy about wearing. She's done a, a compromise deal over immigration and she wants to leave the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, but this plan doesn't necessarily deliver that. I do wonder whether or not the tough talk and the reality are close enough for her liking. Yeah, she did say, didn't she, judge me on my record, and I think we will get the opportunity to do that when those figures come through. Thanks very much, Sam. That is it from Sofridge on Sunday. The Take this morning. Do check out the podcast around lunchtime.